2012 meeting of the Finance Committee of Santa Barbara City Council will now come to order. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on items within the jurisdiction of this committee but not on today's agenda? Hearing none, let us go to our first agenda item. Ms. Tara. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Francisco and committee members. I'm Jill Tara, Treasury Manager, and I'm here today with Ruby Carrillo, our Accounting Manager, and we're going to look at the fourth quarter interim financial report for fiscal year 2012. At this point in time, we can begin to make preliminary estimates, and we have an idea of how we performed, how the uh, actual revenue and expenditures came in compared to budget. This is not a reserves analysis or how we actually came in. It's simply simply uh, measuring our results of how we came in on an actual basis compared to what we planned at the beginning of the year when, we, when Council adopted the budget. So I'll start today and go through the general fund revenues. Then I'll turn it over to Ruby, who will go through general fund expenditures and talk about some of the preliminary results in the enterprise funds. And then she'll wrap up this afternoon with a discussion of the proposed budget adjustments that are necessary at fourth quarter that are going for Council's approval today. And you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at any point in, uh, in our presentations this afternoon. Great. So what I thought I'd do is start with a more detailed look at some of the major revenues. And I won't go through this level of detail at Council, but I'll give you some, a, a deeper look at um, some of the major revenues, uh, starting with sales tax. You can see over on the left-hand side of the table up on the screen shows our actual results. Down at the bottom shows our adopted budget for this current fiscal year for sales tax at $17.6 million. You can see right below 2007, there's a line that indicates really when this revenue started recognizing uh, the full effect of the recession. You can see that the growth started to decline with a 2.5% decline in 2008, 11.5% decline in 2009 and down again in 2010 by 5.1 percent. Re this uh, revenue did turn around last fiscal year and you can see over in the right uh, the actuals by quarter. We had I would call strong growth in the first three quarters of between 2.7 percent and 3.9 percent and finished in the fourth quarter last year with 11.1 percent growth which was uh, very surprising and uh, very good news, which meant we ended last fiscal year with 5.2 percent growth at just over $17.5 million. This year, uh, over on the right at the bottom, you can see our adopted growth was 3 percent from where we thought we would end fiscal year 11, but with that strong last quarter, uh, the June 30th quarter at 11.1 percent, we exceeded uh, where we thought we would end the year. So we actually only needed 0.4 percent growth to meet our budget. Well, we, we grew 0.4 percent. We think we'll grow 0.4 percent uh, growth and more. You can see we've had three very strong quarters uh, this fiscal year. And as you know, the state pays, pays us sales tax um, for a full quarter, and they pay it a quarter in arrears. So we won't know our actual number for June 30th until mid-September, and right after that we'll come back to you with the, the final uh, year-end results for fiscal year 12. So right now we've punched in 4.5% growth, which is the growth that we assumed when we put the budget together for our year-end projection. I think there's some upside potential there in that number based on the strong TOT results in the last quarter of this fiscal year. But for anyway, we'll stick with our projection. And if that holds, we'll end the year at just over $19 million, which is a positive budget variance of um, $1,378,440. And it's good that our major tax revenues are growing out of uh, the recession because they're covering shortfalls in other areas that you'll see later in the presentation. One last thing to note is you'll see that the, the year end for fiscal year 12 at just over $19 million. If you look over on the left, that puts us almost square in the middle between the amount of sales tax collected in fiscal year 2005 and 2006. Of course, if we come in better in the fourth quarter, it will probably put us uh, right around 2006. So you can see we have, you know, still some growth uh, to recover um, from the effects of the recession, but um, strong growth for now. We'll move on to property tax now. 
And this number is um, final for the year. We've received all the disbursements from the county, and we know the, the final amount. You can see that this is um, uh, this revenue over on the left after the recession really declined, and we've stayed flat. Um, not that we've declined substantially, but this is our largest uh, general fund revenue, so when we're down a little bit, it does mean quite a bit of dollars. Um, we budgeted 1% growth um, for fiscal year 2012 at just over $23 million, but because we came in a little short last year in fiscal year 11, when we were down 1.1%, we actually needed to grow 1.2% in order to make that budget number. I want to focus on that subtotal number. You'll see three quarters of the way down the chart on the right hand side. The base property tax that we collected in fiscal year 12 on an actual basis was $22.8 million, so roughly flat from last year, up just slightly at 0.2%. But we did receive a portion of the RDA property tax that was redistributed um, to all the agencies, and our share of that was $873,000 which put us into positive territory um, in terms of growth over last year at 4.1%. Um, so we do have a positive year in variance, but were it not for that property tax distribution, we would have been down or, or flat from uh, fiscal year 2011. We'll move on to transient occupancy tax, our bed tax. We have a 12% bed tax in the city levied on hotel stays, 10% goes to the general fund as an unrestricted revenue source, 2% is receded directly into the Creeks Fund and is used for Creeks cleanup, that portion is restricted. So this table just contains the general fund 10% portion. And I know you receive regular updates on this, so I don't need to spend a lot of time, but this um, particular um, revenue source for the general fund. It's our third largest general fund revenue. Finished out June with a bang at 11.6 or 11 percent growth. We ended the year with 9.6 percent growth on top of the 8.7 percent growth last year. This 13.655 million dollars represents our highest year of TOT collections ever. So we're happy to see uh, the travelers return to our city. We'll move on to utility users tax now, and this is one of the uh, more difficult revenues for us to estimate um, simply because it, it is highly variable on factors that are outside of our control, namely commodity pricing to commodity prices to produce the um, utility um, service itself like electricity and gas, um, and it also is largely dependent on consumption too. Um, you can see that we uh, preliminarily ended the year, fiscal year 12, uh, down 2.1 percent, and we saw a large decline in the gas UUT, um, presumably because of the warm weather and also higher commodity prices. That number would have been much worse uh, were it not for the cable TV UUT, which grew 9 percent, and that's not um, entirely uh, full growth. That contains a one-time payment that Cox made to us about halfway through the fiscal year for a back UUT for a number of accounts that were incorrectly coded as county accounts, which county doesn't have a UUT, and so they didn't collect it and they paid us uh, for that back UUT once it was discovered that those accounts were incorrectly geocoded. So we're ending the year at just under seven million dollars and down 2.1 percent from last fiscal year. Yes. Question. Um, so we've had, just in looking at these tables, we've seen two places where there was a, effectively a discontinuity because of change either in how something was calculated or this one-time payment that came in. Do we keep track of all those so that when we're looking at year-over-year -year trends, we we footnote all of those occurrences? We do. We try and point out the anomalies in, in, in growth in terms of corrections or one-time payments that come in. And when we, use, when we make our budget projections each year, we don't include those into the base. So we take them out and then say we assume it's going to grow 2 percent or 3 percent or 4 percent and apply it to the base excluding the one-time payments so we don't overstate the budget and, and miss the mark. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. White has a question. No, uh, that was a good question. Ah. And then the last major revenue that we'll look at in detail are franchise fees. And um, here's a good example uh, for you, Chair Francisco. Over on the left-hand side, you'll see fiscal year 2006 has an asterisk. If you go down, the reason the growth was so high in that year, it was related to the year when we implemented the additional 1% franchise fee surcharge on SCE, and so that resulted in a large anomaly, and we do track those and try and call them out for you. So this is one that we did relatively well um, this year, um, primarily because of the strong growth in the cable TV. Much like the UUT, there was also franchise fees uh, due on Cox accounts that were misclassified, and the one-time payment resulted in 11.2% growth, which offset uh, the decline in the electric sector. Um, so we'll, we will expect to end the year at just under $3.6 million or 3.4% growth. You will see that the cable TV number is in yellow and italicized. That's because under a state video franchise, Cox has up to 45 days after the end of a quarter and they now pay those franchise fees quarterly. Uh, so we don't know the exact amount of the final payment, but we've put in, you know, our best estimate for that, and it should be pretty close. So that's a detailed look at some of the revenues, and now I'll turn to the PowerPoint presentation um, that we'll go over at Council, which has more summary level schedules. Starting with the tax table. Um, and again, we've tried to factor in at this point in time all the accruals so that we know exactly what the revenue will be at the end of the year. Um, as I mentioned in the sales tax presentation, the sales tax, we've put in the June quarter estimate because we won't receive that information um, from the state until the end of the quarter. This number is also, or I'm sorry, until September. And this number is also a little higher than the numbers uh, that I passed out on the sheet that we just reviewed, simply because this includes not only the Bradley Burns 1% base sales tax, but the number in these summary schedules also includes the Prop 172 half cent sales tax for public safety. So that's a combined number. And, but it didn't substantially, it only changed uh, the, the growth to the prior year by a tenth of a percent. So we went through the major taxes in detail. We'll uh, drop down to the business license number, and you can see we missed the mark by slightly, uh, missed the budget by about $27,000 uh, uh, due to lower renewals this fiscal year over last fiscal year. There were no change in the rates, so it represents a decline in businesses renewing and, and a, a slight reduction in new businesses that became licensed. I will note that that number will expect uh, to see some strong growth this current fiscal year. And fiscal year 13 is our comprehensive business license audit program ramps up. And uh, we'll see a lot more revenue. Again, it'll be one-time revenue because it represents three years' worth of collections with penalties that we're collecting from businesses that aren't in compliance. But a portion of that will roll into our base going forward. The last tax in the general fund is the property transfer tax, and you can see that's up 17.8% growth from the prior year. Um, total sales this past fiscal year in the city were up 36.8%. However, the average uh, sales price per home was only up 16.5%. So that represents an increase due to the um, higher number of transactions that we saw. So we are seeing recovery, at least in terms of, of property selling um, at these um, favorable rates. So total taxes, the annual budget for that is 63.8 million, and we expect to end the year at 66.3 million, which is a positive budget variance of two and a half million dollars. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that'll be go to offset some of the shortfalls in the other general fund revenues. We'll move on to fees and service charges. You can see down at the bottom the annual budget uh, across the general fund is $20.4 million. We came short of that by almost $800,000. Uh, expect to end the year at $19.6 million, and I'll just touch on some of the highlights. 
One is the shortfall in community development of $685,000, and that's due primarily to uh, the slow recovery of development activity in our city after the recession. It's just going to take a while to grow out of that. That's no surprise. We've re been reporting on that uh, for the every quarter since the fiscal year started. Um, community, or I'm sorry, Parks and Recreation Department saw a strong um, growth above their budget. They did a good job of budgeting this year, but they had um, really strong uh, recreation program registrations as well as higher facility rentals, particularly at the, Korea, the newly renovated Korea Rec Center. You can see public safety that combines police and fire uh, service fees, things such as um, um, fire inspection fees and a number of other fees and service charges in those departments coming in slightly under budget. I did want to mention that this number is understated if you look at these combined because there'll be an adjustment that we need to make to um, police department which is factored into these numbers but we needed to reduce uh, the revenue coming into the police department to fund restorative policing because that was not approved as part of the ROPS and so it lowered that number. Um, were it not for that, the public safety fees and service charges would have seen a surplus at the end of the year. Moving on to public works, you can see a $95,000 um, positive budget variance due primarily to increased um, uh, charges by engineering time to the capital projects in the city uh, beyond what they budgeted. And down at the inner fund, uh, that shortage is, um, compared to budget, is due um, almost entirely to the RDA reimbursement. Um, you'll recall that certain, um, the RDA, our former RDA, was uh, prohibited from having employees of its own. So general fund employees provided services both in the community development department and the city attorney to the RDA, and the RDA reimbursed the general fund for the cost of those salaries. Well, with the elimination of the RDA, that uh, reimbursement of those salaries didn't occur, and that's what's causing that shortfall. So um, short in the fees and service categories on a preliminary basis by about $800,000. We'll move on to a, a final summary. You, we went through the taxes with the budget surplus of approximately $2.5 million. You can see the shortfall in the fees and service charges and then a uh, shortfall in the other revenues. Uh, the substantial portion of that, while a number of these other revenues, that includes uh, franchise fees, which we saw are basically coming in at budget, um, uh, mutual aid revenues, um, also includes um, parking fines and forfeitures and the parking citation revenue. And about $130,000 of that shortfall is due to parking citation revenue coming in um, lower than anticipated. And it's actually slightly lower than what we collected last year. But I did want to point out that they had uh, – uh, fewer citations written this year than they did last year. So if you look at the revenue on a per, cite, per citation basis, it's actually higher than last year. It's just they had fewer citations um, issued this year because they've really had uh, problems um, keeping the parking enforcement officer positions filled. So mm. just when they get almost fully filled, someone retires or leaves employment with the city, and so that's been an uphill battle. The other thing is in the second half of the fiscal year, they hired – two new parking enforcement officers and it just takes a while for them to get up to speed and get trained when they're really working independently. Um, a fully trained, operational, experienced parking citation officer will write between 500 and 700 tickets a month. So it just takes a while. We should see um, that improve next fiscal year. So this is the number I like to focus on uh, because it speaks to um, what we budgeted versus what we'll collect uh, for pure general fund uh, revenues. And if you look at all of them combined between the taxes, the fees and service charges, and all the other general fund revenues, we'll generate a $1.5 million positive budget variance. Now, this does not mean that's the amount going to reserves. It's just how we did compared to how we planned to do. We need to factor into that number, though, the anticipated year in variance, and I know you're familiar with this. Um, that represents the amount that we expect to save on the expenditure side and not knowing exactly where in the budget that expenditure savings will happen. We just plug in 
a revenue and say we know on the expenditure side we'll save that. When we factor that in, the general fund um, has a slight budget surplus of $347,000. Now as Ruby will go through at the end of the pres presentation today, there are some uh, fourth quarter adjustments. The ones to the general fund are related to the impact of um, uh, the loss of revenues related to the elimination of the RDA. She'll go through that and explain that. When you factor that in, our preliminary year-end uh, results for general fund revenues are a slight um, budget, negative budget variance of $137,000. Did you have any questions? I don't know. Questions from the committee members? Ms. Murillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you describe a little bit, please, Ms. Tara, the business license audit? Who, what department does that? And is it done yearly? Um, the business license and permits are issued out of the Treasury Division of Finance uh, Department, and I oversee that. And while we try, have tried in the past um, to keep up with uh, identifying newly licensed businesses through scanning uh, DBA listings, the fictitious business license um, listings with the county and in the newspapers, we couldn't identify them all. So earlier. Uh, this calendar year, Council approved a comprehensive business license program to be undertaken by Muni Services, who also provides our UUT and sales tax consulting services. And so they're administering the program. They have about 16 different databases that they research and try, and then they take an extract of our currently licensed business and identify who's operating, who's a business that's in business but isn't currently paying the business license tax. They'll send out a packet and notify the business owner that they need to bring their business into compliance and they fill out the, the packet, put it back, send it back to Muni Services. Muni Services has our tax rate schedule, which is quite complicated. They calculate the amount of business tax due and then send us the file and, um, and of course, the revenue associated with it. So we've um, collected to date uh, about $10,000 uh, through July over the three months when we started, but we expect that to ramp up um, in the next few months as more and more letters go out, more and more packets come back, more and more charges are calculated, and then the people bring themselves into compliance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Ruby Carrillo now. Ms. Carrillo. Good afternoon. Well, I will start with a general fund uh, expenditures. And these numbers are very preliminary. Um, unlike Jill Torres' presentation, um, she has most of her revenue accrual information available. We are still processing payments to vendors and um, recording payroll expenses and those types of things that belong in the fiscal year 12 period. <clears throat> the very bottom row here uh, shows our adjusted budget, uh, which is equal to our year-to-date budget. It captures 100% of the year, <clears throat> and it includes um, our uh, approved budget at June, plus any supplemental um, city council budget adjustments that occur during the fiscal year and then any carryovers from the prior year. And so our total is $103,716,000. Our actual, um, through the date of your report, which is about two weeks old, is 100,193,000, which leads to a uh, positive favorable variance of 3,522,741. All of our departments are reporting to be under budget at this time, uh, but like I said, we still have uh, expenses that need to be recorded, and when we come back in September, we will have uh, year-end results. I do want to point out one department, community development, which is showing a uh, favorable variance of over a million dollars. And most of this will be realized. It has to do with uh, six position vacancies in the department, uh, positions that were either left unfilled uh, the entire year, some that went vacant, and by the time they were filled, um, we had some significant savings. That $3.5 million um, shows to be the year-to-date variance as reported. Uh, we do have an payroll accrual that will be posted within the next week or so of about a million dollars. Um, additional third, uh, vendor, uh, payments to third-party uh, vendors that will hit general fund accounts of about 350000 
And then we have some encumbrances that are still open, uh, purchase orders at the end of the fiscal year that are contracts and we still need to uh, pay those that will carry over to the next fiscal year. Um, in the end, we're projecting we'll have a favorable variance in the general fund of just under $1,700,000. Moving on to enterprise funds. The water fund will not meet estimated revenues. Uh, we reported back during our quarterly reviews that we were not meeting our water sale projections. Um, and so that's, that's going to um, not meet expectations. On the expense side, we're also seeing a significant uh, favorable variance on expenses, just about $6 million on our budget. And most of that has to do with uh, lower production and distribution costs, a lower cost in water purchases, in the use of chemical supplies in treating water. Um, and some of it has to do with lower debt service costs uh, pertaining to the state loan that is funding the Cater and, ground and Ortega uh, treatment projects. Downtown parking, uh, we wanted to... Uh, sure. Mr. White. Thank you. Um, what about the capital expenses there? Is that, is that included in, in that package? Yes, capital expenses were fully realized. We transferred everything that was budgeted to our capital fund to fund our capital projects in, in, in the budget and the plan. In, in water, yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Downtown parking, we did see significant increase from the prior year, 13.1%. Most of it coming from uh, higher parking revenues in the Granada Garage um, that uh, parking a lot there has the highest number of permitters and does have the highest rates, so we did see a significant increase. The airport fund, like the water fund, we have reported during, during our previous quarterly reviews that it was not going to meet uh, revenue projections. We, did, we have seen a, a drop in passenger uh, count just from what's going on in the airline industry, and that has affected our, our parking revenues. So we also had ongoing construction in the short-term parking lot that contributed to that negative um, variance. Mr. White. Thank you. Um, on the passenger count, um, is, what was that, uh, yeah. what was that change? Well, what happens with the bankruptcies and the mergers that are going on in the airline industry, airlines are offering a lower number of seats and, and, and flights, and so that leads to lower passenger count going through <laughs> the airport. And, and, do, and what, are, what are those numbers? Do we have those numbers? Um, I don't have them exact figures. The airport. Six percent below projection. Okay, thank you. On the expense side, um, the airport did hold back on filling a number of positions um, in order to offset that revenue shortfall. They also saw lower uh, repair and maintenance costs. They had a lot of new equipment at the new terminal that was still under warranty and so they didn't have to use their budget to pair for some of those um, repairs. The golf course, although it did uh, bring in more revenues in the prior year, um, it still wasn't able to meet revenue projections. Uh, once again, staff deferred some maintenance costs, uh, such as uh, repainting the clubhouse in order to offset that revenue shortfall. And last, the waterfront also saw significant increases in revenues, 10.6% from the prior year. Um, that was having to do with parking revenues being higher from the installation of self-pay parking systems. They also saw more cruise ships coming through in spring and fall, which created additional revenue in cruise ship uh, fees. No questions? I'll move on to the proposed budget adjustments. Yes, Mr. White. What was the change in the cruise ship fees? There was no change in the fees. There was just no, more I mean, volume. No, I mean, I know, but what, what was that change in volume? Uh, well, they think because of the better weather, we just had more cruise ships going no, through. No, I mean, there's, there's been definitely been a, an, a, uh, an effort to bring in more. I just didn't know what the dollar amount was, the change. In, um, the net amount, I believe it was like $95,000. So hundred grand kind of Yes, thing. Right. but in terms of percentage, it was almost three times higher than the prior year. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. These are the proposed budget adjustments to the general fund. The first item has to do with a payment to PERS. Um, in the past, PERS would uh, 
require that we make what we call a benefit retirement plan, uh, payment. This applies for any retiree um, who exceeds, who, who, is, who receives a retirement benefit that exceeds what PERS is required to fund to that retiree. And in the past, PERS allowed for us to fund it through our normal contributions, our annual contributions. In fiscal year 2012, um, they made a change and didn't really allow much time to its member agencies to determine how to fund this payment. Um, however, it had to be made. So we made the payment, and then staff contacted PERS and had uh, discussions with them about the change in practice. After discussing with them um, how it's funded, how the calculations work, they decided they would go ahead and allow for the city to continue funding it the way it has been in the past, beginning in fiscal year 2013. However, for fiscal year 2012, um, they would not refund our payment, and, um, and we just have to, um, to fund it, and, and now we're asking for a budget adjustment to reflect that cost. Mr. White? Okay. Um, that paragraph or that page, the page two of the report, I would appreciate uh, having a session with uh, staff on that. It's, it's, I think there's a lot of pieces, moving parts in there that I don't understand, and so I would appreciate just going over that literally, word by word, by line, because uh, I think there's some deep material in there that I'd like to understand better. So ordered. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Carrillo, how many, it, was it only the city administrator's office that had this issue with CalPERS? Currently, we only have two employees who fall under this category. Okay. One is in the city administrator's office, the other one's in the water fund. Okay. Um, the water fund, it was about $6,000, which the fund absorbed. Okay. All right. Thank you. The next item is, uh, has to do with an employee who uh, retired uh, unexpectedly. We didn't budget for this. Uh, the employee was eligible for the annuity benefit program, uh, which allows them to convert their sick leave hours into a um, cash payout, and it was for $115,900. We are recommending that we fund this from appropriated reserves. Mr. Samario, I, I was wondering aloud the other day if you knew how much actual sick time this 115000 is meant to compensate for? Did you happen to? Yes. Um, it worked out to be, I think, 2,240 hours that uh, this individual had accumulated. Okay. Since, since they were hired. Okay. All right. Thank you. The next item, um, next several items have to do with the dissolution of the redevelopment agency. This first item impacts the community development department. And this amount represents the amount that exceeded the administrative costs that are allowed through AB 26 legislation, which um, stipulates uh, the RDA dissolution uh, limits and allowable costs. This non-departmental section, the 184,000, will fund the two uh, budget adjustments up above from the city administrator and the police department. The property tax revenue amount of 485307 that is the amount that uh, we are going to ask that the City Council approve to fund the total disallowed costs from the RDA dissolution. The transfer to the general capital outlay fund represents the $331,000, represents the capital project costs that the oversight board uh, deemed not to be enforceable obligations and therefore will not be funded through RDA funds in the future but have to be funded through the general fund. This next um, section here is pretty much um, showing what's happening with that 331000 It's being transferred from the general fund and it's going to, we're going to also transfer the costs over to this fund and so the revenues will match the expenses. So you have a question, Mr. White? I just want to make sure I lined up with that chart with to the very end. This here? Okay, thank you. 
This RDA bond fund, these are four projects which the Oversight Board did approve. However, they changed the source of funding. Um, initially, the city was funding these projects with bond funds that we have on hand, and the Oversight Board decided to actually fund them through the uh, Redevelopment tax, uh, tax Trust Fund established by the county, which means that we'll be able to shift over $479,000 of costs from our bond funds um, over to the county fund, which will be reimbursed, and we can at a future date uh, reappropriate these funds to other uh, eligible projects within the redevelopment project area. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Available to answer any questions. Mr. Wayne? Your question about the about the 115 and just that page is is my it's an exciting area. page I, I agree <laughs> well I we just, could spend a, if you like we could spend a little time talking about those sure, why not yeah. I think that's a good idea I just okay so let's start with the easier of the two the 115,000 um, city employees do accumulate sick leave and for use of it when they get sick whether it's just one or two days here and there or for extended sick time um, and to the extent they don't use it, then they accumulate those. There are, in, in Mr. Francisco, you asked this question and, and I gave you an answer that wasn't complete. There are limits as in, for in certain cases for how much an employee can accumulate. For non-managers and supervisors, there is a limit of essentially one year's worth of hours or 2,080. For the managers and supervisors, whether it be public safety or non-safety, um, there is no cap. So when somebody retires, they are eligible to get those hours paid out in in one of several forms, one of three forms. And it's really at the discretion of the employee. Uh, one way that they can do it is they can they would um, say, I want the money in, in a lump sum, one cash payment. And so we go through a process of determining, sim similar to what PERS does, we take those hours and we, and we figure out what does that represent in terms of years of service credit. So for example, if one, somebody has exactly 2,080 hours accumulated, um, that represents one year of credit, service credit. And so we figure out if they were to work that extra year, what additional PERS benefit would they have received? So I'll make them a number. If, if that turns out to be that, if it, because of that one year, if they had actually worked that year, um, they would get an additional $300 a month in, in additional PERS benefit when they retire. Well, we have to convert that into a a lump sum cal calculation because that's a stream of payments over their expected lifetime. If it's 20 years or 25 years, the sum of all those payments, we have to figure out what's the discounted value of that. And in this case, the discounted value of that stream of payments to this employee that they would, they would normally receive for the rest of their life, if it was a PERS benefit, we discount that back and it turned out to be $115,000. They can receive... So on that, so sure. do, does the city get the benefit of the seven and a half or seven and three quarter percent rate of return that PERS gets in order to back that in? So what happens is if, so we, we pay them the $115,000, it has no impact on their actual benefit they receive from PERS. So their PERS, if they had 25 years of service, this sort of treats it as if they had 26 for purposes of calculating with their cash distribution, right. but PERS will still pay them on a 25 year basis. So there's right. no impact to PERS or our rates or anything like that. We just have to come up with, in this example, $115,000 for the discounted value of that payment that they would have received over their lifetime. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward calculation that we do. It's just taking a present value of a stream of payments for their expected life. And you know, we use the same sort of assumptions that PERS does in terms of mortality rates and all those things. Um, and the 7.5%. We do not use a 7.5%. We use, the, we use a, a rate that's established by IRS, and it's a more short-term rate. So I think that the rate used in the calculation of this payment was on the order of one and a half percent. So we get to pay out at uh, backing in a one and a half percent rate of return. Uh, that doesn't sound like we're getting both heads we lose, tails we also lose, because uh, yeah. we're paying. Uh, am I? Yeah, I know, that seem, I know what you're getting with this, but we don't we don't have a real loss because of this, but it does. You know, makes a bigger payment that we have to make, doesn't it? I mean, if we had a seven and a half percent rate of return on this, we'd be paying no sixty thousand dollars or forty thousand dollars. No, no? The, 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 if we had, if we actually, if they actually worked those hours 
and therefore got an additional benefit from PERS, the dollar amount would be exactly the same. The benefit to them would be exactly the same. There'd be no actual impact of that. They just work one more year. We just we have a different basis of calculating a cash payout, and it is a differential there. And and I would I would I agree with you that using a one and a half percent has doesn't seem logical because we're using a short term rate to determine a you know what is really a long term you know commitment if you will. Um, so that's something that you know we have to recognize because that is a rate that changes every year. And it just so happens that right now the rates are very, very low. So the discount rate that we're using of one and a half percent is going to result in a higher payout than if, would, if we had done this calculation, same set of circumstances five years ago. Um, that's just the nature of our, how our policy works and how we make those calculations. So I thought that was the easier of the two, but that's how that works. Mr. Samario, do we have a choice about whether we make a lump sum payment or monthly payments? The um, the employee has a choice to receive a lump sum or, or a strict, uh, you know, an additional monthly payment. Okay. And in those cases, what we would do is we would take the same calculation. Instead of giving them a check for 115000 we would go out and buy an annuity contract with an insurance company, and we go out and solicit those. And it would cost us probably a little more because there's a, an administrative fee that is associated with that. But we, instead of 115 we might pay 120 to generate $300 a month for the rest of their life, you know, based on that those calculations. So it's the same payment stream, um, but we would either pay to a contract of uh, somebody who sells us the annuity or to the employee if it's the employee is slightly less because there's no administrative fee. But it's the same calculations, the same dollars essentially that go out the door from Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and this is a negotiated benefit as part of the compensation yes. package. Yes. Thank you. A little, a little background also on it. And, and, um, PERS offers this same option. And what that means is, as an employee, you know, in uncertain plans, an employee can say they can get service credit for their unused sick time. And many cities, they use PERS to provide this benefit. So, for example, an employee might have 2,000 hours of sick leave built up. And instead of the city dealing with this, they retire a year early and they get this benefit. And for some reason back 20, 30 years ago, our city in most cases in, in, in negotiations with the employees decided to not have PERS provide that benefit and instead have the city do this. So it's from the employee standpoint, they're, they're even versus, you know, what they would have gotten if they had done this through PERS or the city does it. I think your, your issue is a good one in that when interest rates are low like they are now, we're buying an annuity at 1 or 2 percent versus if we had been contributing to PERS over the years for this same benefit, because that's what we would have been doing. We would have been paying to, to PERS. They would have been getting their, their rate of return, which, you know, typically, you know, is 7 and 3 quarters or 7 and a half percent. And part of that's because they invest in equities and, you know, all the, and on this annuity, I guess they would also be investing in equities. But the history of it is, is that the city at some point 20, 30 years ago in conjunction with negotiations, decided to not be have this a part of our PERS plan, but instead do this annuity thing, which you know does create these one-time costs when a long-term employee with lots of sick leave on the books retires. The other thing is, I, I assume that the reason they came up with this plan years ago was an incentive to try and get employees to not use their sick leave because for every hour you didn't leave, you know, didn't use a sick leave, it basically allowed you to retire earlier. And so that's the, the history of it. And as, a, as just a, an outsider who hasn't worked in a big operation during my lifetime to witness this, that there, last year there was another administrative office uh, payment that was in the six figures. These are big numbers, and, uh, it, it, they're, and yet they're kind of hidden. So it, it's something that, again, I'm concerned about and, and want to, of course, we'll learn more. We're learning more about the, the retirement benefits and all that. But, but this, is the, this is a bunch of the cost of an officer for a year that is just cash out of pocket uh, that, that's coming up kind of by surprise. Yeah, and if I can add to that, we, 
when we've talked to you in the past about not just our pension li unfunded pension liabilities, we talked about what we call our OPEBs or other post-employment benefits. Sick leave is one of them. That's one that we're not funding on an advanced basis that at least GASB would suggest we start doing. And we do have, a pl you know, our intention is when we do our put together a budget next year to start doing some of that, start sort of charging departments, particularly the general fund, but all across the city, a little bit of a premium to cover these things that occur unexpectedly and they're unbudgeted, but we start accumulating these funds separately so that when these payouts are, are needed, we have the money already accumulated to cover these things. Um, but it is an unfunded liability for now, and we're hoping to sort of establish a funding mechanism so that we're not hit so dramatically in any given year. And, and that would be another good one that is part of, I know we're talking about more of this to happen in a month or two or three of discussing retirement uh, costs. What is that liability at this point? What is that unfunded liability that the city has around this yeah. benefit? And we brought that to you before. We'll bring it again this okay. year. We're doing, well, a, new, we're doing okay. a new actuarial study this year. We'll have that fresh for you Great. Thank in a you. few months. Great. Do, Next. Do we want to talk about the, the – we're done then? No, no. no. Oh, okay, you want to talk about the other one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> done right. with that one. So the, <laughs> the other item is – the IRS, and in this, I was just reading some document that uh, Mr. Armstrong sort of sent out and I'd seen before, but the IRS apparently is looking for ways to minimize what they consider to be tax shelters, where, where folks are committing so much of their, their post-retirement funds into these defined benefit plans, and they're able to spread them out over the retirement and therefore avoid paying more taxes than they otherwise would have. So they're trying to put a limit on how much an employee can receive through these qualified plans, such as PERS, it, through retirement. And they have put a cap, and that cap is impacted by when the how old the employees when they are when they retire. But they don't make those determinations because they don't have any way of predicting that, but they don't make those determinations um, until the employee actually retires. They, they, they determine, okay, what's their benefit going to be, and how do they compare against that limit that they've established, that the IRS has established relative to their age, et cetera. And if they exceed that limit, they say, well, we can't pay for that benefit out of our own funds, out of these, through this qualified plan. The cities, the member agencies, have to come up with that separately out of their own pocket. So that was, that's always been the rule. That's never, hasn't changed. That's just been the rule all along. Prior to this past year, what PERS allowed us to do, however, is to, and I'm going to make up a number. Let's say that we had, we owed $50,000 to them because we have employees exceeding the, the limit, right? So we would write them a check of $50,000. They would allow us to offset that $50,000, in my example, against what we, norm we pay for everybody else, or our normal annual contributions to PERS. So it, we're paying on a net amount the same. There's no impact to us. So whatever we assume we're going to pay, whatever we pay separately through these other employees who exceed the benefit, we can directly offset that so the budgetary impact is zero. There is no impact. So that's what's always been happening. They establish these limits. When employees ex exceed the limits, we are able to offset it through our normal contribution requirements so that we see no impact budgetarily. In 2000, you, know, you want you have a question of that? That's still I don't not clear. understand that. I, that's okay. I, I just okay. I so don't understand that. Okay. But, uh, that, this is something I need to, maybe we need to sit down and talk about Sure. That. And I'll just close by saying that it, what's, why it's an issue this past year is that PERS changed that rule. They no longer allow that offset. And they, the reason, which I think is a really a lame excuse, but they said that they, over the last several years, have been implementing a new pension management system. That's how they track things. And they didn't, weren't able to include a feature that allowed them to track these sort of offsets. So they said, sorry, because of a system glitch, in effect, you are now having to pay us the additional amounts and no offset. And that's what's happening for this year. I've talked to the chief actuary, and they say that they're going to hopefully try to do a change to the system so that they can allow this. But in, for us, at least, and, and maybe others who come to them, they're going to allow us for 13 and 14 to offset like we used to in the past, and hopefully by then they'll have changed their system to, to correct this glitch. But for 2012, we're sort of stuck with this extra payment of $68,000. I'm glad to meet with you one-on-one -on -one to, to go over that again, but hopefully that was somewhat helpful to some. Very good. Any more questions? So we need a motion here to accept this and recommend that the council accept these adjustments. Okay, I so move. And second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Sounds unanimous to me. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Meeting adjourned.